Welcome to the Eat Y'all podcast, where we discuss the struggles and successes of the farmers, food producers, and chefs who are working to get better ingredients into restaurants today and to ensure their availability in the future. This episode of the Eat Y'all podcast is brought to you by the National Veal Promotion and the Beef Checkoff. Discover more about delicious veal at veal.org. Welcome to this episode of the Eat Y'all podcast. I'm your host, Andy Chapman, here with my co-host and wife, Mariana. Hey, hey. We are still in the veal world, and what a world we are in. Yes. This is the second episode from our trip to Indiana. We were outside of Fort Wayne, and this particular episode, a few minutes outside of Fort Wayne, is an absolutely precious town called Roanoke. It's huge. You can sneeze going through it. But super cute and really well cared for little community. And inside of this precious town was absolutely fabulous restaurant that apparently is known quite far and wide in the region called Joseph de Quis. Yep. And it is uh, the home of Chef Marcus Daniel, who is remarkable, talented, and we sort of guessed that he would be based on the recommendations and the research that we did, but it was a meal to remember. And I think, you know, I had in my mind what someone would do with veal based on my own experiences, based based on going and eating at an Italian restaurant in Boston and some things like way back in the day. And, you know, we only get the veal parmesan, but this, (laughs) this was not that. Yeah, this was not that. And I just kind of want to, I'm going to throw out some just little, just a couple little teasers of. Okay, so let's set the stage. So we've been on the farms all day. We took a little break. We met back up at at Joseph DeQuise. The restaurant is closed. So it's it's a dark night. It's an open kitchen concept. So Chef Marcus is back there, us and him cooking a three-course veal-centric dinner in this beautiful space in downtown Roanoke, Indiana, and he just whips out with the first course. And look, I, I got to say, well, uh, he, well, fill in the blank. What did he what did he cook for the was, first course? It was veal tartare. And, it was. And there was a little bit of trepidation among some people in the group like, ooh, tartare. That's, that's Yeah, we scary. won't name any names but or raise any hands in this group here. But it was he... He made an incredible dish. He fried, basically took okay, some... Okay, let's just talk about the tartare okay. for a moment. I have to say that I, in the past, have not been overjoyed by my experiences having beef tartare. And I love beef. It's one of my favorite ingredients. However, veal tartare, as he prepared it, might be one of the most delectable and lovely dishes that I've ever had in my entire life. It was it was monumental. And I believe other people sitting at the table felt the same way. So just as a oh, teaser yeah. of what yeah, happened sure. that I think will be unpacked in the, the podcast yeah, episode. Marcus kind of talks us through his menu a little bit more. You know, you're going to want to listen to this and hear what this guy is doing. Because, I mean, we're not talking about just typical expected veal recipes and menu items here. He, he did... Just extraordinary things with extraordinary local ingredients added to this beautiful veal meat that Strauss Feeds provided to him and used many different cuts and types of veal on his menu. And so, I, yeah, chefs who are listening, I, I really can't recommend highly enough that you tune in and and listen to how he cooked the product and what he thought of it. And look, I took some great pictures. Well, I mean... I took them, but they, <laughs> they were they were pretty good. That should be included in the uh, in the blog post that you can get to from the show notes if you're listening to this and go to the show notes. So there's a veal Kafka. There's some. There's several fun things you want to you want to check this out. Yeah, and, for uh, sure. We'll get into this episode. Basically, we're going to recap the visit to the farm, sitting around the table after having this lovely course veal menu prepared by Chef Marcus Daniel, and also just hear how he approaches this ingredient for his own menu and hopefully inspire you to do some fun things with this protein that is actually a great option, available option, and might, I mention, 
I think we can say the pricing is flat on this protein lately. And for those of you that have been watching the markets, that isn't so for just yeah, everything. It and it's so funny because it, it is a premium. A, yeah, premium it's, product. It's a, f- a premium product. And as recently as, you know, as we're recording this, it, it had not it had not gone up as much. Really as hadn't had any inflation other, hit it. Many other things in the case. Yeah. Also, at the end of this episode, you're going to hear the lightning round. And sometimes people ask, like, why do you do the lightning round? And I think you'll get a real sense of uh, who Steve and Marcus are on a personal level and also some of the things that really drive them and, and kind of give them a kick uh, <laughs> in their lives. This was a really fun lightning round. And to get to hear their answers was was great so yeah really stick around funny. for the whole the whole thing and we'll get it started right now all right let's do it welcome to the eat y'all podcast i'm your host andy chapman and i am sitting here in what what is this town roanoke indiana roanoke indiana uh all of downtown is one street and uh, i'm sitting here with chef marcus daniel and farmer steve anderson is it steven or steve or steve's good steve anderson and we spent the day together, fellas. How was it? Well, we're, we're still together, so it was good. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're more more full now than when we started. Was that, yes. Would that be fair to say? Yes, we are. So we started off, Steve, tell tell folks about your business because we started our day at 830 this morning at, yeah. at your place. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a commercial feed company that makes veal feed and calf milk replacer. And uh, then uh, we have farms that we went to. And we sell the feed to ourselves and feed at our, our farms. And we saw a nursery farm today where we raised the calves for the first seven weeks. And then the finishing farm where the calves are taken up to 500 pounds, uh, which is market weight for today's veal. Awesome. They look so joyful. They were happy. They had a lot of spark in their eyes when they looked at you. I was surprised at how we did not hear a cow moo. I've been on hundreds of farms. I don't think I've heard a quieter group of, they're just hanging out. They're, mm-hmm. Yeah. They were lounging today. Yeah. Is that, I mean, is that common in the veal industry? And just, they're just. It is. Yeah. After they eat, they uh, lounge around and, uh, you know, the whole new concept of housing for, for veal in the, that came about in the last 10 years uh, allows them to move around and uh, run around and kind of lounge. And uh, yeah, it's kind of neat to see. For sure. Yeah. They had the freedom to come out and lick your hands and nibble on your shirt when you got too close. So, Steve, you make, for for lack of a better word, I mean, I'm just going to make this like a five-year-old would say it because I feel like that helps me understand it. But your company produces cereal (laughs) for... Essentially, right, you're, you're producing the food for a lot of the veal industry. Is that, is yeah. that fair? Yeah. So we're, we're just animal nutrition, uh, animal infant nutrition. So when a, uh, a, a calf is born or, or a lamb, um, they, they need milk as, as they come off of their mom. And so that's what we produce. So we're, we're a baby formula company for infant <laughs> animals, mainly calves. Awesome. So Marcus... Have you been on veal farms and veal barns? And- I have not. This was the first one, first time. So what did you, did you have in, in your mind an impression of, hey, this is what I'm going to see? Um, I think, you know, the typical idea for for veal, not, if I was unaware of what Steve does and he, you know, raises veal very well, the the freedom that they can walk around and, you know, they're they're happy. I was surprised about the chain of dairy and, you know, we tasted the, the dried whey. That was really interesting. It was yeah. nice and sweet. It was it was a big it was a big man- manufacturing job, you know. I didn't realize it was going to yeah. be like that. Yeah, we're tightly connected to the dairy industry. Yeah. We buy the calves from the dairy farm. We buy the whey from the cheese plants uh, and other milk, like a skim milk plant. We utilize a lot of the dairy products and uh, very connected, well connected to the dairy industry. Mm-hmm. And when we were touring, Alex used the word recycling, which he kind of winced when he said the word recycling, but... I love that concept of trying to use all the byproducts because I know 
the best chefs, right, are whole animal. They they use everything. They use the tongue. They use the yeah all the awful cuts that you know they 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 do everything. And so your industry kind of mirrors that in the dairy industry. Talk a little bit about kind of how you guys upcycle yeah. with. Yeah. Yeah, so so the uh, the dairy farm wants to keep the heifer calves to raise to uh, to be an adult and, and milk and to, the bulls are have been a byproduct in the past. And the same with the cheesemakers when they make cheese, they take the curds and the whey is a byproduct. So we take both those items and put together and try and raise a really good quality protein product that uh, is uh, attractive to a chef like Marcus. So Marcus. Does he actually grow an attractive product for you? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I mean, you tasted it. It was, it was pretty delicious and, and different cuts as well. Like we had the ground and uh, the top round as the tartar. And then, of course, the beautiful, what do you call it, a lollipop chop? Lollipop uh, yeah. center cut veal chop. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the fat was very, very nice. Just melted away in your mouth. It was, it was pretty delicious. So, and I want to kind of jump, you're jumping ahead of where I wanted to go, Marcus, okay. because one of the things that when I think of veal, the first thing when we were talking about this project, mm-hmm. I thought of veal, veal Parmesan. <laughs> There's a lot of like Italian restaurants or whatever, and you can go and get veal parm, parm chicken yeah. parm, whatever. And Marcus opened my eyes to a lot. I mean, you can Google and there's some of the places where I live are very limited on veal options. Now, look, we got shrimp. I can give you a thousand shrimp ways to do shrimp, like Forrest Gump, right? You know, yeah. you could just sit there and list them off. Of course. But veal is not something that I personally have had a ton of interaction with. And it's not, we talked about earlier, Mississippi is not really a veal producing state. So when we came here and I said, Marcus, I would love for you to cook some veal dishes tonight. I had in my mind, like, what I thought you were going to do and what I, what did you think I was going to do? I don't know. I was thinking, Oh, there's probably going to be some Parmesan cheese and we're going to make a meatball or we're uh-huh. going to, we're going to do some sort of breadcrumbs. A saw, you know, I, I just had in my right. mind, like, this is how a lot of people have used it in my life. And, and that's not I mean, impugning you. That's impugning my own, like my box that I was in on veal. So talk through kind of your process for you. Steve brought you ground. He brought you some top round. He brought you some uh, some chops, which to describe those are they look like a kind of a baby tomahawk almost. <laughs> they, um, they were massive. Talk through the dinner impressive. you made, because I, I want other chefs to understand your mindset of what you did, because I was fascinated. I think everybody here was blown away who's had veal before. I'm like, OK. So you took the same product and you did something totally different, totally unique and amazing. Well, the first course was a veal tartare. Um, you can eat, you know, beef raw, fish raw, everything like that. I didn't see an issue with it. My When I go forward thinking about a dish, especially when you're dealing with the veal, is that you don't want to overpower the the subtle softness the the flavors that the milk gives the veal the the tenderness the and it was so my first dish was the top round it's a very lean cut so we chopped it small i simply tossed it with a little olive oil and salt for the vehicle we used a overcooked rice i spread it thin in the dehydrator dehydrated it and dropped it in a fryer. So it was um, like a, a crackling or a chicharrone. And it, it, it made for a nice airy spoon, if you would. I threw a little bit of house-made A1 because for me and my palate, I like uh, acidity. So the, the A1 always has a nice brightness to it. It has a little umami to it, if you would. Sure. We got really nice hush cherries. They're ground cherries if uh, no one's ever seen them. They they look like very small orange tomatillos. They lend a sweetness and a savoriness in your bite. When I first had it, it took me a while to actually enjoy it. But it all, it all went together pretty well. I had a little smoked uh, aioli, which we smoked the... Oil and pecan chips, 
and uh, just made a, a simple mayo. So uh, I kind of like to hit the, all the notes yeah. on each bite. And I kind of feel like we jumped ahead because when somebody hears that, they're like, okay, this is not the uh, this is not the chef of the local diner there in Roanoke. Talk <laughs> about Joseph Dequi. Dequi, Dequi yes. Dequi, because I'm... You know, that's not how we say every word uh-huh. you know, where I'm from. So I'm trying to get it right. So talk about kind of the, the place that you are here, because this is a a jewel of this area. Yes. Culinarily. Uh, so Joseph Dequi has been open for about 20 years. I took over about five years ago. The reputation of Joseph Dequi's was very high standards, very elegant, very white tablecloth. You know, the, our servers wear bow ties or ties, vests. It's, it's very proper. So I was, I was walking into something that I had to uphold their their reputation, you know, tradition of serving excellence. I think that you know, everything in my past prepared me for the opportunity that I was able to come and, you know, I believe I excel. But the restaurant raises full-blood Wagyu. Six miles away at our farm, we also raise chickens, eggs, produce, herbs, you know, flowers. It's all, and it's all at my fingertips. I really appreciate that and the creativity I'm able to have with everything. So you kind of, we were talking earlier in the car and as far as your, your produce order, you don't actually drop a produce order. <laughs> the people picking the produce right. say, here's, here's what you get, right? No, I think on my produce order, it said I have 30 pounds of more beets and 15 pounds of tomatoes and, you know, a bunch of, I got 40 years of corn coming <laughs> and it doesn't. Uh, so you get whatever's right, not, you don't. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a farm. When it's ready, it's ready. And I then have to be ready. Whether it's going on a plate in the uh, dining room or one of our caterings out at the farm, or we preserve it for a later date, whether that's pickling, fermenting, you know, we dry herbs, we've dried chilies and made our own chili powder. You know, we try to be as uh, creative as we as we can. And Steve, you've been coming to this restaurant for a long while. Years. Twenty years. Yeah. You were talking earlier about how you were you were standing outside when it was a private club, wishing you had been invited in. Yeah, that's right. It's really unique in this small town. We are a very small town, and to have a five star restaurant like this is just amazing. It's uh, we we take it for granted, but it's really convenient and amazing for us to be so close. And. Kind of give people an idea on the map where we are and then just a quick how many seats you have. Obviously, we we were in kind of the bar area mm-hmm. earlier. You've got this dining room. You've got some other rooms. You've got private upstairs. Like, just give people a quick, you know, 45 right. second visual tour. We are, we are um, in northeast Indiana in a very small rural town. We uh, started in a bank that... We use the vaults for wine, temperature controlled. Our, the bank is our club room. Very comfortable, very loungy, kind of dark, rustic, you know, wood. We even have our Wagyu fur on the uh, bar seats. So you go out of the club into the cafe where we have an open kitchen. So you're able to say hi to the chefs or Say you love the dish, or you 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 know you really didn't like it, or, or do people just, ever tell you they didn't like your food? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a special person that comes in every Thursday and comes uh, back. Yeah, every he Thursday keeps coming back, but he doesn't like it. He, sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, but he's very open with it. I appreciate it. I I can't please everyone. It's okay. I mean, I don't I I don't know if I make food that's too polarizing. But it's very forward in in the flavors. Like I'm not hiding behind a little sprig of marjoram or something. So you pass the cafe and you go into where we are now. It is our conservatory. Out of the four walls, three of them are glass. And when it's sunny and it's beautiful, we have a very nice patio. And then we have a nice uh, art gallery a little further. 
where a local artist named Penny French is our uh, in-house artist. It is incredibly beautiful, for mm-hmm. sure. All right, so I know we kind of just, we, we did course one of what you did with Veal. The second one maybe was the most surprising to me because you took ground veal and mm-hmm. took us to sort of almost a street food. Yeah. So we did a kafta, which I used the veal and uh, sweated onions, garlic, ginger. It had a nice lot of warm seasoning, such as like a little bit of marsala, uh, might add a little star anise and uh, lemon zest, cilantro, mint. So I wrapped it around a skewer and we did a lettuce cup. I also made date and black garlic barbecue sauce. So it had a little sweetness, it had a little richness. It was it was very nice, stuck to the uh, kafta pretty well with a little garnish of gherkin cucumbers and hapanada peppers, which have no spice to it. So hence the habanada. So that's like the cousin to the, it's like the quiet cousin to the habanero. Yeah. Yeah. It, you get all the pepper flavor, but no spice. And it's, it's pretty nice. It's pretty interesting. So Steve, you and I ate that, that one. And I feel like that was the one that of everything surprised me. What'd you think about that yeah. dish? Yeah. Same thing. I, I, when I dropped it off, I wondered what he was going to make with that. Yeah. It was just the same. It was amazing that he came up with that creation. And he, he mentioned earlier about the creativity and that really is what, excellent chefs do unlike myself is is create and, and almost be an artist with the with the food and and really beyond that though really food is about the taste and man tonight it was all explosion in your mouth of the flavors coming together so i really appreciate that it's amazing so how often steve do you eat veal well i'm a little biased so i'm probably two three times a week mainly fix it at home and then enjoy it in restaurants like this so you're not one of these people that sells the product that you don't actually no. imbibe in. No, no, I love veal. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. So ha- what ways have you seen veal on a plate that really blew you away? That you were like, oh, that was creative. And I love that as yeah. different and, and unique. Because, I mean, there are kind of some standard things. Yeah, but the then- standard things of veal chop is excellent. And the scallopini, veal piccata. It's great. My, one of my favorites is take that veal chop and pound it out into a, in the, into a melonade. So it fills the plates. It goes beyond the plate. still has the bone sticking out of it. That is uh, really excellent. But then you get you some unique stuff like uh, sweetbreads. Marcus makes some of the best sweetbreads uh, around, uh, veal sweetbreads. Mm-hmm. And you can take it as far as veal brains. I've had veal brains with scrambled eggs. So, I mean, we, I, I've probably tried it all. And, uh, Literally nose to tail all yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. nose to tail. Yeah, that's awesome. I read uh, today that Wiener Schnitzel is veal, which when I was in Germany 20 years ago, that I ate a lot of that because it was something yeah. that I, I tried once. I was very food nervous in a foreign country. My brother was stationed there and he was like, try this. Yeah. And so I ate that like every different yeah. restaurant. I was like, I know I like this. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was in Austria and we would go into the airport in the airport was the big picture of Wiener Schnitzel. So that's, that's uh, oh yeah, get over that direction. That is uh, very, very, very popular. That's funny. We're so thankful to our friends at the National Veal Promotion for taking the time to educate us about veal, an ingredient that honestly, Andy and I didn't know that much about. In addition to being a high quality protein that you can trust, A three-ounce serving of trimmed lean veal is a good source of key nutrients, including vitamin B6, vitamin B12, niacin, riboflavin, zinc, and more. Even better, a serving of lean veal has just about 170 calories, making it one of the most nutrient-dense protein foods around. To learn more about veal, visit veal.org. That's V-E-A-L dot O-R-G. All right, so Marcus, then you you brought us home with your third dish. Yeah, so we finished with the lollipop chop. I sous vide it for about four or five hours at 130 degrees. While we were out on our tour, I had it going, and I I have this beet dish that I've been uh, putting on the menu. It is our farm-roasted beets 
and it has uh, has a red pepper and hazelnut romesco uh, tossed around. I, I just thought that the romesco and the earthiness of the beets would would kind of complement the the veal. It wouldn't overpower it, but it would it would lend to it very well. I think that the uh, sous vide that we did on it was a really nice time, a real nice temperature, and it turned out really well. We just simply seared it with a little bit more salt and uh, served it. The crust on those chops was incredible. I mm-hmm. mean, it was it looked golden. Like it would almost look like you deep fried it. <laughs> I mean, it was it was perfectly done. Yeah. And then when you you know you slice into it, it was just absolutely beautiful. That was kind of a was a heck of a way to finish it off. I love beets, but when you added the the sweet and the nuts and all the yeah. texture of that with the with the chop, man, I I got to tell you that's a that's a home run dish. Well, thank you. That's a home run dish. That's and again, I haven't had a ton of veal in my life, but I'd order every week. I mean, that's. Yeah, to be honest with you, it was very surprising. It, it turned out really, really nice. I thought. Do you have? Do you feel like you have any presuppositions or kind of things that you're like, well, this is what I thought about before today. That anything that you've thought about veal that has changed in the last twelve hours. There is a uh, quite a bit of science that goes in into properly uh, providing nutrition for the the veal. I was very surprised by that. Uh, we walked into a room that had about seven monitors with a bunch of numbers, and I couldn't tell you where the start button or anything was in there. <laughs> it was very scientific. I was, too, very surprised that the the finishing barn or the nursery was very quiet. Like, it was very uh, peaceful, and, you know, they, they played with each other a little bit here and there, and... I thought it was. I thought it was pretty nice. I I was surprised that the veals made it to what five hundred, five hundred fifty. Yeah, five hundred to five hundred fifty pounds. Yeah, yeah, live weight. Yeah, yeah. So they're a very large animal. Yeah, yeah. It's nice. I, I think the thing that surprised me the most was the flooring and the setup in the in the in the pens was one of the cleanest barns I've been in. Like it just really was, and the way everything it was was set up is just a fantastic way. Because the way to we raised animals, and you know, family and friends raised animals growing up was a, a dirt floor, right? And so, or even on concrete, somebody's got to go in and clean that thing out every day. Yeah. And the raised floor and the the system that those barns have was. Obviously, well thought out, well engineered, and I don't right. want to get too graphic, but super clean versus what a lot mm-hmm. of barns have. So right. I, I, I loved that uh, aspect of it because that kind of blew my mind. It didn't smell as farmy as, as some mm-hmm. farm uh-huh. smell. Is, yeah. that, is that fair to say, Steve? Yeah, yeah. We take pride <laughs> in, in the cleanliness and uh, in, in the really the packer harvest them. The packing plant really appreciates that as well because uh, it makes a big difference on their line as well. So. Yeah, it's very important throughout. Yeah, I, get, I can imagine that would save them a lot of uh, headache, bringing a clean animal in the right, door, right. for sure. Yeah. What we're going to do here in just a second is jump into the lightning round, and uh, we're going to go through a few quest- questions, try to stump you guys, and see what see what we can learn. And uh, Steve's wife is over here. She's our, our lone audience member left. I don't know where everybody else went, but uh, she's she's live, so y'all don't you can't lie. Um, if you you get to this one, because there are questions where she's going to be involved in the answer, Steve. So we'll, (laughs) we may even get her to answer this question because it's going to be a good one, but we'll jump right into the lightning round. All right. So Steve, we'll start with you. Biscuits or cornbread? No doubt. uh, Biscuits. Biscuits. And this is a man who's surrounded by cornfields. I love that answer. Yeah. Well, I think the last meal, one of my last meals, if I was to choose, would be uh, biscuits and gravy. And I lived in mm. Mississippi as well for a while. So put a little hot sauce on there and three eggs over easy. Oh, eggs. I'm good, man. <laughs> I like it. How about you, Marcus? 
I like a good biscuit. There's different types of biscuits, though. There's the flaky and the doughy, and you know, it just has to be really good. Do you like a dense, like heavy, like it's a quarter pound of butter in there, or do you like it a little more like flaky pastry layers? I like the flakiness myself with a little jam and butter, a little bit of salt. I'm a fan of that. You can't underestimate the salt on a biscuit because that actually is the thing that really makes all the mm-hmm. the fattiness in there <laughs> like pop. I, I've also had good cornbread. But <laughs> well, I mean, you have I to just, choose. But. As much corn as we passed today, I just knew I was going to get two cornbreads. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, because we, what did we pass? 100,000 acres oh, of corn? Yeah. <laughs> But biscuits is the that is the correct answer. So that's good. <laughs> All right, Steve, cats or dogs? Dogs. 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 If a dog is under thirty pounds, it's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> Agree. <laughs> totally. That's the exact way that that should be answered because nobody likes a yip dog. No. I, I mean I have a cat terrier at my house. Yeah. <laughs> Not a little choice. ankle biter. It's not, you know. yeah. 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 There's been a can few, it mangled, few mangled ankles. It can't protect you, right? No. If it, it will, fits in your purse, it's not going to protect you. It will bark and then get kicked, but <laughs> it's, uh, I don't know. I guess you warmed up to me. Star Wars or Star Trek? Hmm. Star Trek. Star Trek. Can I tell you a story? Sure. Okay. We're in your restaurant. You can tell us whatever you need to. When I was in California, I was talking to this girl, and she she asked me that question: Star Wars or Star Trek? I'm like, I don't know, Star Wars. She said that's the wrong answer. So why? Because Star Trek can really happen. Star Wars is a fantasy. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Huh. So I'm I'm still I still don't know which is the right answer. I personally would like to watch Star Wars. That's your that's your favorite. I don't know about favorite. I would rather watch it. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, there you go. All right. So if you had a, you get down to uh, you have one dinner left with veal. What's your what's your final meal in prison with veal? It doesn't have to be prison. It's just your final meal. Like, what are you getting? I mean, I have that veal tomahawk chop pounded out in the melonese with piccata sauce on it. Any sides? You know, whatever Marcus comes up with, that's good with my gnocchi. Oh, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, gnocchi. Yeah. How about you, Marcus? I don't know. It's tough. Probably a dish I haven't came up with yet. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Good answer. What is, what's the most memorable meal you've ever had? Hmm. Is there anyone? Is there any one dining experience? My wife pointed at her ring like it's our wedding meal, but and and actually at our wedding we ran out of veal, so that was that was that was memorable. So what I was going to say as well is our engagement across the street at an Italian restaurant uh, thirty years ago was my most memorable meal. And you had veal that night. I had veal that night. Yes. It didn't. Your most memorable does not have to include veal, but. Uh, it could. So for you, I mean, it's your kind of your whole world. So, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, how about you, Marcus? I, I look more so to a, a very good bite. Those kind of poke out a little bit more. Uh, chicken liver toast at the Spotted Pig, one of the best bites ever. That's the first time I liked chicken liver. I had a good, a pretty great meal in LA at Animal. That's the first time I had brains. That was pretty tasty. I've eaten a lot. We would uh, go to about three different restaurants in a, in a night. I think the last hoorah I had before the COVID was I was in Chicago, and I went and put reservations at Oshawar, and then went to the other corner and ate at a Little Goat. Reservations was... Uh, you know, five o'clock, we had reservations, went there and ate and ate. We left, walked around, then I went to the publican and ate. <laughs> then we left there and went to Al's and got a uh, beef, beef and sausage sandwich, get it dipped in Chicago, and then went across the street and got a uh, lemon ice. 
I thought you were going to say you got a deep dish pizza on top of that. And I was like, I'm no. kind of wanting to I, uh, call in sick not already. not a fan of the deep dish, but Chicago pizza is, is the best. Not deep dish, the tavern uh, style pizza. There you go. It's delicious. Favorite barbecue. You got ribs, brisket, pulled pork, or smoked chicken? Uh, I'm going with the ribs. Like baby backs or St. Louis style? Spare, spare ribs. Spare ribs. Yeah. I'm a fan of the brisket. I'm a fan of a really good fatty brisket. I do like ribs, though. There you go. Ribs or brisket. Burn ends. Burn oh, ends. Yeah. Burn ends. Burn ends for sure. They're done right, man. That's a that's an amazing thing. <laughs> All right, so you can have dinner, Steve, with any two people, living or dead. You can make Marcus wants to go first on this one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Forget that your wife can hear. It. No, I'm kidding. No, any two. So you got every everybody from. I mean, you could go back to Moses, or you could, you know. Mm. To keep it somewhat lighthearted, I would say uh, Action Bronson and Anthony Bourdain. Action Bronson. Action Bronson is a is a rapper. He does. Uh, you have to enlighten a, me. He, he, he has his own cooking show. Okay. He has two cookbooks that made it to New York's best selling list. He's he has, a mu- musical artist too. Yes. Yes. He uh, started out in the kitchen. He hurt himself. Started rapping. Got pretty good at it. Started uh, on Vice, doing his own TV show. It's called F That's Delicious. It's pretty animated. And then, of course, Anthony Bourdain. Hmm. All right, Steve. Wow. Okay, two people. Maybe not at the same time, but I'm going to say I want to break bread with Jesus. Oh. And I, I really got a lot of respect for Abe Lincoln. I'd like to, uh, he always ate a hard boiled egg and black coffee for breakfast. So, I, yeah, I'd want to sit down with Abe Lincoln as well. Old Abe. That's a, and, and Jesus. I mean, would you like do loaves and fish with, or what, what would ceviche? Yeah. yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that, I don't know what Maybe the, yeah, I don't know quite, yeah, I don't know quite what we'd eat, but yeah. Something Probably wouldn't be ribs. <laughs> no, no. But you know, who knows? All right. So how do you, both of you guys are, are two different sides of an, of, of an industry that is long hours, Sometimes high stress. We were talking to Alex about if something breaks, right? You got thousands of pounds of product that's not getting out the door like it's supposed to. Mm-hmm. You guys have stressful every day. Four hundred people. Then you know you, you. There's lots of that on both sides of the of, of the coin here. How do you unwind and de stress and like when you? How do you take the the pressure valve and let it go? Yeah, because it can get to you. So I, I think uh, for me, it's just uh, home, being home. I don't do so well on the road, but when I'm home, it's uh, relaxing and kind of being with the family. Probably couldn't do it without my wife. So, uh, yeah, that, for me, that's what it is. Uh, I, I try to listen to loud music at work, and then when I leave work, I listen to nothing. I drive with the windows down, and all you can hear is the air. So then I I think I like cigars, so I smoke a cigar. You know, I used to tell people I went home and kicked the dog, but that, that was a past life. <laughs> and nowadays I kind of matured a little bit, but everyone deals with stress differently. So what kind of cigar do you like? Right now I like Palencia. It's a Nicar- Nicaraguan cigar, and they do a really good job. Awesome. I have seen those, but never had one. They're good. That sounds sounds delicious. Mm-hmm. All right, couple more. One concert, any band in history, Steve? Who do you who do you pull back from the from the grave, or or that's still out there touring? And you're like, all right, I hadn't hadn't seen it. You know, I've always wanted to see ACDC, but uh, never had that opportunity. So would you get them like fresh out of the like 1986, where they're still mm. able to run around a little bit? <laughs> Yeah, what I found on these older bands is they sound the same, but they uh, don't just don't look on stage. Don't don't look at them. But, uh, yeah. The Rolling Stones are still running around. Mick Jagger. Yeah, there the you go. Uh, drummer just died. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How about you, Marcus? I like hip hop, so I don't know. Uh, Biggie, you know, uh, Erica Badu. I've seen Lauryn Hill already. I've seen Nas. I never got to go see the Stones. 
my mom really liked the Stones. I never went. Hmm. I don't know. That's it. Those are all acceptable answers. Okay. I've, I've, I haven't seen any of those in concert. <laughs> so there you go. Well, listen, thank you all for being really good sports, and thanks for spending the day with us. It's been a, a treat for us, and I appreciate you all giving up literally a whole day to uh, both share your culinary skills and your farming skills and your people, both front of house and back of house here, and your guys and, and gals that fed us lunch and let us walk into their barns and on their properties mm-hmm. today. That was really an eye-opening thing for me. And I think we learned a lot. I think we mm-hmm. we have a lot of stories that we can now tell firsthand from our experience here in Indiana. So yeah, I appreciate that. We're glad to share. Thank you. Uh, and Marcus, dude, the food, uh, I mean, I was just blown away. And I knew when we started doing a little Googling to see what was happening here, I was like, I could probably give him one of my tennis shoes. <laughs> But this was absolutely incredible. And I think I speak for everybody at the table saying it was a, it was tens across the board. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for doing that yeah, for us and much. hosting us and letting us come crash your restaurant and rearrange everything and That's pull okay. out, pull out all the, all the stops for us. So we appreciate that very much. Yeah. Thanks for coming up. You've been listening to the eat y'all podcast hosted by eat y'all founder and chief relationship officer, Andy Chapman. If you enjoyed this episode, It would mean the world to us if you'd join us in our mission to save family farms by subscribing and leaving a review. Even better, share this episode and follow us on your favorite social media account at Let's Eat Y'all 